Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson, and this is the third video in a series that's intended to help you to envision the outlines of the constellations in a way that will help you to see their connections to the ancient myths and scriptures and sacred stories of the world. The outlines of the constellations, if you use the method that was proposed by H.A. Ray in 1952 in The Stars, A New Way to See Them. This is, this is my copy. This is not the one that I had as a child. That one, um, I think, completely fell apart. But um, this one, it, this in The Stars, A New Way to See Them, which was first published in 1952, H.A. Ray outlines a way of finding the constellations, which is extremely helpful for finding them in the night sky, but also although, to my knowledge, he never mentioned it, the system of outlining the stars proposed by H.A. Ray appears to line up with the system that's used in the ancient scriptures and myths of the world. And we'll see an example of that as we look today at the constellation, the extremely important, mythologically important, and uh, found throughout the myths of the world playing very central roles as you look at the extremely mythologically important constellation of Sagittarius, as well as the nearby constellations of the Southern Crown, which is Corona Australis, Australis meaning of the South, Corona meaning crown, so it's the crown of the South, Corona Australis, located right next to Sagittarius, and then a little ways uh, to the south of that, the constellation of Era, the altar, era the altar. And all three of these constellations are nearby one another and located in the vicinity of the brightest and thickest part of the Milky Way, the Milky Way band that we see when we look out into the heavens. The brightest and thickest part of that Milky Way band that we see is thought to contain the galactic core or the galactic center. And the constellation Sagittarius when we're looking towards Sagittarius and on the other side of Sagittarius, Scorpio, they flank the brightest and widest uh, central portion, we believe to be the central portion of our Milky Way galaxy. So let's go inside the planetarium. I use the planetarium app Stellarium. It's a free open source app that you can download. It's not fully online. You can't just use it online, you have to download it. But the Planetarium App Stellarium that I mentioned in the first two videos of this series, we're going to go inside the Planetarium. But if you haven't watched the first two videos of this series, I recommend that you go back and do that. So I'll have a link to uh, the first of those videos up here. Um, and then from there, uh, you can go to the second video. And the, the second video also has a link to the first video. So I'll put a link to the second video right here if you have already seen the first video but you missed the second video which is about the constellation Hercules and the Northern Crown. So today let's go inside the Stellarium Planetarium and see the distinctive features of the constellation Sagittarius and we'll see some examples of how that shows up in ancient myth and even in ancient artwork. Okay here we are inside of Stellarium and as you can see, I am doing this on August 18th, 2018, and I've moved ahead to about 8 p.m. And we have a glorious lineup of planets right now looking to the south from the northern point of view of an observer in the northern hemisphere here at 35 degrees north, looking towards the south. We have a glorious lineup of visible planets right now in 2018. These planets um, will not always be in these constellations. They move through the constellations along the zodiac band. These are the zodiac constellations that we're looking at here. This is Pisces over here, Aquarius, Capricorn. Here's Sagittarius, which is the star of tonight's broadcast. Then Scorpio, Libra, Virgo. But um, the, the zodiac band is the constellations that are roughly along the plane of the ecliptic, which is the plane that all of our um, all of our planets orbit the sun. So the sun, 
goes along the ecliptic plane. It's called the ecliptic because when something comes in the way of the sun, particularly the moon, then we get an eclipse, but uh, along that plane. But anyway, right now, you can see these beautiful planets are all lined up. I'm looking towards the south from the northern hemisphere. If you think about it on our spherical Earth, if you're in the northern hemisphere, such as latitude 35 degrees north where I am, then in order to see towards the plane of the sun, you've got to look towards the south. That's why the sun is going to arc across the sky um, towards the south. That's why your garden, you want to plant it towards, facing towards the south because that's the rays of the sun in the northern hemisphere are going to get the direct rays from the sun uh, most directly from the south because of this fact that on the northern half of our celestial, of our terrestrial sphere, you have to look towards the south to see uh, the plane of, of our orbit around the sun. So along that, that, plane, that same plane, as we look towards the south, east is going to be to our left as we look towards the south, and west to our right. East is obviously to the right when we look north, but now we're looking south, so east is to our left, west is to the right, so sinking down into the west just after sunset in uh, August of 2018, we've got uh, Venus is still visible, but not for very long after the sun sets, then Venus will also set in the west. Then we also have Jupiter, which right now is moving through the constellation Libra. I've written a few blog posts about that. The um, brilliant planet right here is the moon, <laughs> so uh, I would take that out, but um, the moon right now is in its early early part of its phases. But the way to unclick on something is control click. But anyway, this is Jupiter. The, the moon is not going to look like a star like it does here. We can, on Stellarium, you can use this uh, night sky here to dial up the size of the moon. You can dial up the size of the moon, dial it down. Uh, scale moon is where you do that right here. So you can make the moon get to you know, the size that you more familiar with seeing it at night by dialing it up. But, um, so ignore the moon for our purposes right now of pointing out the planets. This is Jupiter. That will be, um, after Venus sets, Jupiter will be the brightest. Well, actually Mars right now is even brighter than Jupiter. So Mars is really bright right now. And then in between Mars and Jupiter we have the planet Saturn is actually passing along the bow of Sagittarius here. We're going to talk about finding Sagittarius. But right now, the, the planet Saturn is just above the brightest stars of Sagittarius are sometimes known as the teapot. We're going to talk about the outline of the teapot in Sagittarius. And you'll see an extra star above the teapot. That's not a star, that's Saturn right now in 2018. But you don't always see that. And then bright very bright and very large Mars. Um, I've said many times, I've never seen Mars this bright and this large is moving right now in between Capricorn and Sagittarius. So that's from looking from the west towards the east. There's our lineup of planets. But I'm going to take the planets out because uh, for our discussion of the constellation Sagittarius, I'm going to remove the planets because you're not always going to see those planets if somebody's watching this video in 2019, the planets will be in completely different configurations due to their continuing orbits around the sun. So let's look at the constellation Sagittarius and the nearby southern crown and then Era, the altar, which is just below the southern horizon. We're going to have to remove the southern horizon to see Era, the altar, from this latitude and this time of year and this time of night. But there are times when you can see a little bit more of era the altar. So first let's just zoom in on Sagittarius. So in the first video in this series we talked about how to find Scorpio using the bright portion of the Milky Way. Scorpio dominates the summer sky in the northern hemisphere. This time of year is a particularly good time to see Scorpio and Sagittarius is on the other side of that brightest part of the Milky Way from Scorpio. So as the 
night progresses, now we're in August here, as the Earth continues to rotate, Scorpio is going to continue to angle down further and further towards the western horizon, and Sagittarius is going to rise towards the center of the uh, southern, if we're looking due south, we're going to see Sagittarius rising towards the top of its arc here as Scorpio arcs down towards the western horizon there. So let's focus in on Sagittarius. We've already spoken about how to find Scorpio, and Scorpio is pretty easy to outline. It really does look like a great serpentine, sinuous, beautiful kind of S-curve with a, a delta of stars at the front, which you can uh, connect as the claws of a scorpion or as multiple heads, sometimes as multiple heads. Now, Sagittarius, the name Sagittarius means archer. The, the word sagitta in Latin, from which we get Sagittarius, sagitta means an arrow. So Sagittarius means someone who shoots arrows, an arrower, or as we would say in English, an archer, someone who uses an arc, which is an older name for a bow. So this bow gives Sagittarius the name of the archer. You can see Sagittarius appears to be pointing a bow directly towards the scorpion, towards the heart of the scorpion. In fact, in the const uh, constellation of Scorpio, we have this bright reddish star Antares, Antares, Ant Aries, the rival to Mars. So Sagittarius is pointing its bow roughly towards the heart of the scorpion. But seeing the entire outline of scorpion, uh, uh, excuse me, of Sagittarius is a little bit challenging unless you know how to find this uh, shape of the teapot. So let's turn off the stars, uh, let's turn off the outlines rather, momentarily, by clicking on this button here. We can toggle the outlines on or off. See that? I'll move my date time a little bit out of the way. So you can see, here's the outline of Sagittarius and the brightest stars, you can see the brighter stars are a little bit larger in the uh, planetarium app. The brightest stars of Sagittarius make this outline which has been in uh, more recent times known as the teapot because it has kind of a little handle here. Remember the song of I'm a little teapot? I'm a little teapot short and stout. Here is my handle on this side and then over here we have here is my spout, kind of a little triangle over here and here's the top of the teapot, the lid maybe that you remove to check on your tea I recommend drinking tea every day. I love tea. I like uh, oolong tea. I like green tea. When I went to China, that's when I really started drinking tea. Um, but here's the lid that you can, they would always have a, a pot of tea on the table in the restaurant, and you could uh, make tea for the whole dinner party. And you remove the lid here, and the tea leaves would be inside, maybe in a little basket in an infuser or floating free, but here's the teapot. Now, I don't think in ancient times they called it teapot, but it looks some, somewhat like a, a, a little, um, what's the word, a lamp, a little oil lamp. And in fact, the, the teapot shape of the constellation Sagittarius does play, I'm convinced, an oil lamp in some ancient scriptures and ancient myths. The sacred act of pouring out oil, anointing with oil, often has to do with Sagittarius because of this outline. This outline of the teapot also could be envisioned, I realized, as a grasshopper or a locust. See here, instead of being just a teapot, this outline could be the body of a grasshopper. Here's his head. It's got two little antennas sticking up here. And then here's one of his legs. You know how grasshoppers have kind of extra large rear legs that fold up. So a grasshopper or a locust. Do you know any myths that involve a locust? See these legs of a grasshopper. The tea, teapot outline of Sagittarius is very distinctive. And like I said, in 2018, we do have 
the planet Saturn just above the teapot. Let's go back to, um, I'll just put the solar system objects back on for a moment and we'll see. I just brought in the planet Saturn which looks like a kind of a dull yellow, dark yellow star. It's not as large as Mars or Jupiter in the night sky. There's Jupiter. Oh, sorry, that's the moon. Stellarium's confusing me now by putting the moon in there. Um, these newer versions are slightly different than the older versions that I'm used to. But um, anyway, so Saturn right now is above the teapot in the night sky. The little, the little uh, teapot isn't really a constellation. It's a part of Sagittarius. Now I turned off the solar system object so we don't see the planets. So you can see this teapot. Now let's find the rest of Sagittarius um, using the teapot. So the teapot helps us find the bow of Sagittarius, the rear legs of the teapot. This is the bow of Sagittarius. And the body, the upper body of the outline of Sagittarius is kind of the head of that grasshopper or the handle of the teapot. See here in the handle? That forms the body of Sagittarius and then there's this long long ankle length skirt or very long skirt and then two legs here and then a triangular shaped head of Sagittarius with a plume rising up. So that's a very distinctive part of the constellation Sagittarius that plays a role in many myths and scriptures Here's the outline of Sagittarius, outlined per H.A. Ray. Here's the teapot portion. The, the lid, the spout, the head of the grasshopper or the handle of the teapot makes the body. And then there's this triangular head of the outline of Sagittarius, the archer, with a single eye right here. So triangular head, that's the next easiest part to find. It looks a little bit like the antenna from the grasshopper if you're envisioning the teapot as locusts. Then you see these two uh, antennas sticking up. But this triangular head with a single eye and the rising plume, that's the next easiest part of Sagittarius to find. And then you come down here to the skirt outline there. You see that and the two legs of Sagittarius the skirt. So some people might ask, well, why is Sagittarius sometimes a centaur? I've talked about this in some of my books, including my most recent book that's just coming out right now. This could be the tail of a horse right here. Mars is right near that tail part. And then you could have another leg up front going to one of these stars here, or even two legs up front. So now you have a horse's body with a tail and then a torso of an archer here. So that's how you turn it into a uh, centaur with his tail, this kind of um, diamond tuft at the end of the tail. You can see that Mars is actually right near that right now. There's Mars. Okay. But let's just concentrate on using this outline. This outline will explain a lot of ancient myths right here. This skirt and this uh, bow and this plume rising up from the triangular head. And then right nearby and closely associated, we have the southern crown. Not quite as brilliant and dazzling as the northern crown, but very distinctive. You can see the stars of the southern crown right there next to Sagittarius. Let me turn off the... Can you see those? So there's your teapot. Directly down from that, you can see the southern crown. Beautiful southern crown. And Scorpio, uh, tail of Scorpio with the two cat's eyes pointing right towards it. And then this smoky portion, the brightest, smokiest, widest portion of the Milky Way, very important for a lot of myths, as I discuss in Star Myths of the Bible, which is Star Myths of the World, Volume 3. Also, Star Myths, Volume 2, which is about Greek mythology. Very important that Sagittarius is right next to this wide portion of the Milky Way in a lot of myths. And I'm going to show a piece of ancient artwork here that shows that the ancients... See, some people might say, well, using 
the outlines of H.A. Ray, you can't use those to discuss ancient myth because H.A. Ray didn't publish those until 1952. Well, H.A. Ray appears to have either stumbled across or been privy to or maybe was connected to the spirit world in some way and then was given this information or, or this got inspiration from this ancient system that H.A. Ray is talking about in 1952 matches up with the ancient system. And I'll show you, here's a piece of pottery from ancient Greece from the early 5th century B.C. That means the 400s B.C. and the early portion of the 5th century B.C. would be like 490 B.C. This incredible piece of ancient pottery is the name vase of, we don't know the name of the painter, but historians uh, and classicists refer to this painter as the pan painter because of a uh, uh, picture on the other side of this vase, which you can see this vase in the Boston Museum of Fine Art, the MFA in Boston. This vase is there. It's a beautiful vase. Here's how big it is next to me <laughs> in the Museum of Fine Art. So now zooming in on that depiction of Artemis, the goddess Artemis slaying Acteon, the unfortunate hunter Acteon was slain by Artemis when he saw her bathing in a pool uh, with her nymphs. And then Artemis turns Acteon into a stag and he's torn apart by his own uh, hunting dogs. Well, in this ancient piece of pottery, the pan painter has depicted Artemis slaying Acteon um, and his hounds are tearing him apart, but he's not really turning into a stag in this painting. But you can see the outlines of Scorpio and Sagittarius uh, very clearly forming the basis for this ancient artwork. These correspondences in the artwork on this ancient vase from 2,500 years ago show very clearly that the ancients were envisioning the constellation Sagittarius in exactly the same manner that H.A. Ray shows in his constellation outlining system published in 1952. We can see the clear similarity in the angle that the bow is held and in the angle of the body of the goddess in the depiction on the ancient uh, vase from ancient Greece and in the length of the skirt or the dress. And we even see the detail of a plume or a tassel depicted atop the quiver of arrows over the back of the goddess corresponding to the plume atop the head of the constellation in the night sky. This vase is just one very dramatic example, but there are literally many hundreds of others, not just from ancient Greece, but from other cultures, and not just in artwork, but as we'll see in the actual texts and myths, the details of the scriptures and the ancient sacred stories themselves. Now that we've taken a look at the constellation Sagittarius and the outline of the teapot, which looks like a locust or a grasshopper as well as a teapot, I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 9. And I've written blog posts about this and I've written about this in some of my books. But this will help to see how the ancient scriptures and ancient myths use these constellations in the descriptions, the characters and episodes that are recorded in the ancient myths and ancient scriptures. So Revelation chapter 9, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came up out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and, under them, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any living thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. 
And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, and it, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. Okay, so... We can see in that passage many references to the constellations that we were just talking about. And one of those is obviously the tail of the scorpion. And right nearby we have Sagittarius, which as I said has a dot on its forehead. Also has the southern crown right next to it. Has the teapot stars, which can also be envisioned as a locust or a grasshopper and can also be envisioned as a centaur or as a uh, horse with someone on the back of the horse with a bow and arrow riding to battle. Now the smoke rising up from the bottomless pit and from the furnace is the Milky Way. The brightest, thickest, smokiest part of the Milky Way is right there next to this portion of the sky that we're looking for, right through the portion of the sky that we're looking for. And just below the horizon there, rising up from the bottomless pit. You see the, the stars themselves are actually in the infinite heavens. There is no bottom. There is no end to the heavens. They are in the infinite realm. Or when we look out into the heavens, it is an infinite realm. So let's go back into Stellarium and we'll take a look at one other constellation, Era, the altar from which this smoke is billowing up. The brightest, smokiest, thickest clouds of the Milky Way billow up from Era the Altar, or Era the Altar is just below the horizon in the latitude that I'm located, below the horizon, below that smokiest, thickest portion of the Milky Way. Okay, so here we are back in Stellarium, Stellarium, and let's take a look and see if we can uh, show where the altar of Era is located. This is the top of Era the Altar. So the further north you go, the further below, or the, the lower in the sky these constellations are going to be. And so at the latitude here, even at the highest point, Era is not getting significantly above the horizon. So you have to go further south. So I'm just going to remove the horizon. It doesn't for the purpose of understanding the myths, we don't need to actually be able to see the constellation in the night sky. You just have to know the constellations. So I'm going to remove those uh, cardinal directions as well. So now you can see that just below the horizon we have this outline of Era the Altar with two little stars inside. Even though it just barely crests above the horizon in my latitude, the the glow, the, the light in the, the atmosphere, the thickest part of the atmosphere is going to catch a lot of those uh, light beams and bounce them around. So the, the glow near the horizon is going to drown it out unless you go further south. So you're not really going to be able to easily see Era the Altar the further north you go. But if you're uh, in the uh, further to the south in the tropics or even in the southern hemisphere, then you'll be able to see Era the Altar. But uh, Era the Altar is below this brightest portion of the Milky Way, so you can imagine the smoke rising up from the altar. Okay, so uh, bringing the horizon back in here. I hope that this little discussion will help you to find the constellation Sagittarius, an extremely important constellation. You can see 
how close it is to Scorpio. You can use the outline of the teapot that I described here, the outline of the teapot. Those are the brightest stars that you're going to see first. And then from there, you can trace the triangular head and the plume, and then the outline of the long skirt and the legs. So there is the constellation Sagittarius. And then once you've found Sagittarius, I hope that you can find the southern crown. That's going to depend on how dark of a sky you can get and the light pollution. And it will depend on, you know, the further north you go, the lower in the, towards the horizon these constellations will be. But perhaps you'll be able to find Sagittarius, maybe even for the first time, or you can, maybe you've seen the teapot before, but now you can find the rest of the outline. And latitude permitting, maybe you can also find Era the Altar.